Brother and sister in Christ, have you ever pondered why do you believe in Jesus and all the teachings about him? Many people say that I believe him because Since I was a little one, my parents brought me to church. That's why I listened to the Bible stories told by Sunday school teachers. As a teenager, I listened to the pastor sermons, attended catechism, and was baptized, then became a, an activist in the church. All those things just happen to go along with time and become a part of my life. And I believe that they are all true. And the Bible as God's word, the source of God's truth is revealed. So fellow in Christ, it is important to confess that the Holy Scripture as God's word, Amen. The source of God's truth and believe it 100% and never be doubted intellectually. I want to tell the story of a great preacher who eventually lost the faith because of his intellectual doubts. You know Charles Templeton? Charles Templeton, he was a close friend and preaching associate of Billy Graham in, in, the, uh, in the 50 and 40s. He effectively preached the gospel to large crowds in a major arenas. However, intellectual doubts began to nag at him. He questioned the truth of scripture and other core Christian beliefs. He finally abandoned his faith and made an unsuccessful attempt to persuade Billy to do the same. He felt sorry for Billy, saying he committed an intellectual suicide by closing his mind. Templeton resigned from the ministry and became a novelist and news commentator. He also wrote a critic of the Christian faith title, Farewell to God. My reasons for rejecting the Christian faith. Interviewed when he was 83 and suffering from Alzheimer's disease. Templeton talk about some of the reasons he left the faith. He said, I started considering the plagues that swept across parts of the planet and indiscriminately kill, more often than not, painfully, all kinds of people, the ordinary, the descend, and the rotten. And it just became crystal clear to me that it is not possible for an intelligent person to believe that there is a deity who loves. When asked what he thought of Jesus Christ, Templeton would not acknowledge him as God. Rather, he responded, he was the greatest human being who has ever lived. He was a moral genius. His ethical sense was unique. He was the intrinsically wisest person that I've ever encountered in my life or in my readings. He is the most important thing in my life. I know it may sound strange, but I have to say, I adore him. Everything good I know, everything decent I know, everything pure I know, I learned from Jesus. 
He is the most important human being who has ever existed. And if I may put it this way, I miss him. Templeton's eyes filled with tears, and he wept freely. He refused to say more. So, brother and sister in Christ, many people miss the opportunity to know Jesus as Lord and Savior because they rely more on their intellect rather than opening their hearts to the Holy Spirit working and enlightening their hearts and mind. Actually, today's uh, topic is, is there any evidence outside of the Bible that Jesus exists? But I don't think we need to dwell on this topic anymore because uh, we have already discussed uh, various extra biblical evidence regarding the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. So that it means if there is historical evidence regarding the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, then of course Jesus did exist, right? So I changed a, a little bit. The topic became the source of our knowledge about Jesus. And the same scripture reading is taken from John 21, 24, 25. This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who brought them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. In other words, John the Apostle wants to say that if we need a lot of empirical evidence so we can be sure that Jesus existed, then the whole world has not room to write it down. So can you imagine? In the beginning, what's the word? And the word was with God. And the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made that he has been made. The whole universe is the evidence of Jesus' existence. Right? The word who from the beginning was with God at work. And the word became flesh in Jesus. So brother and sister in Christ, yes, our knowledge, our source knowledge are almost totally depend upon the New Testament and particularly the four Gospels we have. Although there are, there are early uh, documents other than the New Testament writings which refer to Jesus or the beliefs of Christians about him, there are of little interest to any except, especially historians. As I've uh, explained this in, in, in the previous sermons on the Good Friday and Easter, right? But we have in the 66 books in the Holy Scripture should be enough to prove it and become the reliable source of our knowledge of Jesus. So that there is still room for faith to witness the assistance of Jesus. We need faith, not only empirical evidence. And I believe that the Bible is the source of our knowledge of the real Jesus. It seems the certain sayings of Jesus and certain aspects of his life, especially his death and a resurrection that we have celebrate, uh, celebrated last week, is were singled out as being of particular importance and were passed down 
And of course, the early Christians seem to, to have identified what was essential and so important among Jesus' words and deeds and faith and passed down by oral transmission process. And the second generation brought it down into the Gospels and letter. An excellent example of this process of transmission may be found in, in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, almost certainly dating from the period of oral transmission. So do you remember this, this word, right? This is in Bahasa. In every time uh, we, we approach the, the Lord's table, the, the Lord's Supper, I always read 1 Corinthians 11, 25. For I receive from the Lord what I also deliver to you. That the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed to bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, do this in rem remembrance of me. In the same way, also the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So it is clear the source knowledge that Paul is passing on to the Christians, which had been passed on to him by the oral transmission. The same way happened to the gospel writers. You can compare to uh, in, in Matthew 26, 26 to 29, uh, 28, Mark 14, 22, 24. Luke 22, 17 to 19. So Jesus saying may have become, I think, may have become detached from their original context and perhaps on occasion even been given a new one simply through the use to which the first put them, proclaiming the gospel to those outside the early community of faith and depending and informing the faith of those inside it. Like uh, Paul said in the first Corinthians to uh, the church in Corinth. So there is every reason to suppose that those early Christians preserve and transmitted faithfully the substance and the meaning of Jesus' teaching and actions. What the gospel writers did indeed pass on to their readers authentic tradition concerning Jesus, those traditions were selected based on the needs of early Christian church as it sought to spread the gospel. And perhaps John's gospel states this point most uh, clearly in John 20, 20 uh, 30 to 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, he said which are not written in this book. So that's selected based on the needs. Which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So here we see that the Gospels of, uh, are, are not primarily concerned with the events associated with Jesus Christ, but with the interpretation of the significance of these 
events. So we could say that they mingle history of the real Jesus and interpretations of Jesus' teachings and deeds. In that they indicate the significance of events rather than merely recording them like historians. So similarly, we find Paul appealing to an oral tradition which combined the report of events, right? For example, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 3 to 5, about Jesus' death and resurrection with the interpretation of these events. Forgiveness of sin. However, brother and sister in Christ, it is also obvious that the gospel writers were simply not interested in reproducing precisely historical accounts of everything which Jesus said and did. For them, historical simply means based on historical fact not strictly exact chronological account about absolutely everything which Jesus said and did. There can be no doubt whatsoever that the gospel accounts of Jesus contained information mixed up between biography and theology. So the early Christians were convinced that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God and their Savior, and naturally felt that these conclusions should be passed on to their readers. For this reason, the fact of the real Jesus and interpretation are so thoroughly intermingled in the Gospels. So with this point in mind, the basic assumption that the gospel were essentially factual accounts of the history of Jesus, which could be interpreted by the reader. This point presents no difficulties, uh, no difficulties whatsoever for the Christian reader of the gospel who share who shares the faith of the gospel, the gospel writers concerning the identity and uh, significance of Jesus Christ. No brother and sister in Christ. As believer then, what should we discover about Jesus in it? What important things should we find about the real Jesus in the Bible? I think at least we should discover four important characteristics of the real Jesus in the Bible. First, the first characteristic of the real Jesus, that he is deity. You know, Christianity came into a world dominated by Caesar worship. Penyembahan kepada Kaisar. And you could worship any God you wanted to as long as one also worshiped the Roman emperor who was acknowledged as curious. Of course, Christians refused to acknowledge Caesar as Lord, right? That little was reserved for the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Curious, depending upon the context, can mean sir, master. And in a Christian context, in, in, in Septuagint, translate Yahweh, Jehovah, 
as curious. And starting from chapter 1, John has said that Jesus is the word made flesh. Then in John 6, 38, 39, uh, 6, 69, Peter makes a confession. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. In John 13, 13, Jesus says to his disciple, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Even Thomas, who didn't believe that Jesus had risen, finally said in John 20, 28 to Jesus, my Lord, my God. On the day of Pentecost, Peter preached to the crowds in Jerusalem in Acts 2, 36. He said, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, whoever wants to find the real Jesus, first find the Jesus deity. I would share a brief story. Years ago, there was a big lump of something laying in a brook in North Carolina, uh, Carolina. Most people just walk past it, judging it to be nothing more than a common stone. One day, a man took it home and used it for a, door, a doorstop, like in the picture. A visitor one day examined and found it to be a lump of gold. And you know, many see Jesus as just a lump of good humanity, a lump of a good prophet, a lump of a good teacher. He was all that and more. But until we see the gold, the deity, we do not have the real Jesus. The real Jesus, he is God. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, 3, Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Second, the real Jesus is his sinless humanity. Brother and sister in Christ, the real Jesus is not only God, but he also is a man. John Chrysostom was an important early Christ, a church father who served as an archbishop of Constantinople. He said, I do not think of Christ as God alone, but both together. For I know he was hungry, but also with five loaves, he fed 5,000. I know he was thirsty, but he also turned the water into wine. I know he was carried in a ship, but he also walked on the sea. I know that he died, but he also raised the dead. I know that he was set before Pilate, but he also sits with the Father on his throne. I know that he was worshipped by angels, but he also was stoned by the Jews. And truly, some of these I ascribe to the human and others to the divine nature. For by reason of this, he is said to have been both God and man. It is very important to discover Jesus as God. 
But it is equally important to see Jesus as human. Even though he is sinless humanly. A few months ago, we discussed the, uh, the Gnostic teachings, which only recognized Jesus as a spark of God, but that his appearance as a human was only false, fake. Of course, this is not a teaching from the Bible, right? To counter this heresy, John states in 1 John 4, verse 2. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Real flesh. In 2 John 7 also said, many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone into the world and such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. On the other hand, it is the same as antichrist when someone teaches that Jesus was only human, a prophet. A good teacher, but he is not God. Such person is the deceiver and the false prophet. Yang ketiga, saudara, the third one, the Lord Jesus is Christ. You know the word Christ is from the Greek Christos. Equivalent of the Hebrew word Messiah or anointed one. Though it had become something of a proper name, it yet retained its messianic association. Jesus is the, is the chosen one in whom God is well pleased to fulfill his purposes planned from of the beginning. Peter's confession of Jesus as Christ in Matthew 16, 16. Also, when Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say the, the Son of Man is? And then Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But the Lord Jesus emphasized that this word didn't reveal to Peter by man, but God the Father in heaven. So God the Father himself revealed the real existence of Jesus through the mouth of Peter. When Martha, who was mourning the death of her brother Lazarus, was met by Jesus. Jesus said to her in John 11, 25, 26, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they will die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And Martha replied in verse 27, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Then we know the next story. Jesus raised Lazarus, right? Brother and sister in Christ, just as they look for the Messiah to come in the Old Testament and a hope that found its fulfillment in Christ. So we all look for the same Messiah to come again one day. And that hope will not be disappointed either. Dr. Franz Hafner was a revivalist 
He authored nearly 40 books during his ministry. He says, the early believers were not looking for something to happen. They were looking for someone to come. Looking for the train to arrive is one thing. But looking for someone we love to come on that train is another matter. As Paul wrote in the first letter to the church in, uh, in Thessalonica, chapter 1, 9b to 10, they tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Steve Mayers was a senior pastor of Calvary Chapel, South Bay in Gardena, California, tells a true story about a man who bought a painting at a flea market in France after World War II. And he stored it in, the, in his attic for decades. That's the painting. Finally, it was noticed and praised in a, a, a praise in 1993. It turned out to be a painting by Vincent van Gogh. Worth millions, that painting. All those years just sitting there drawing dust because it hadn't yet been discovered only in the attic. And you know, Jesus is much more precious than billions. So don't let Jesus draw us in our lives. Indeed, the world needs to be presented with the real Jesus. They need to discover that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, who came and is coming again. For us believers, we need to discover in a fresh way what we already have, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the fourth, the Jesus in his spiritual prosperity. First of all, brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to realize that in Christ, we experience a change in status from humans who are enslaved to sin to become free children of God. As Paul says in Romans 8, 14, 15, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive doesn't make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. And here is the spiritual prosperity in the real Jesus we have. Paul says in verse 17, Now, if you are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with, with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. This is also emphasized by Paul in Ephesians 1. Third. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And we receive all of this spiritual blessing, not because of our efforts, but by grace we have been saved for faith. It is the gift of God. God's riches always transform the person who received the gift. 
one nodded. That's how grace is. You don't change to receive God's grace, but you change as a result of experiencing the grace of God. God's grace is like corrective surgery. We are helpless, but God gives us grace. And God's grace changes what we ourselves cannot change. So, brothers and sisters, what we discover here is that our entire well-being is totally depend upon God. Calvin Miller, he was a professor of preaching and pastoral ministry at Vision Divinity School in Alabama. In his book, Into the Death of God, he shared the testimony from a poor Christian woman who lived in the 80th century the woman, I don't know when I have had happier times in my soul than when I have been sitting at work with nothing before me but a candle and a white cloth and hearing no sound 